All right, everyone. So this is chapter 16. So in this chapter, we're going to cover sound. Remember, sound is a longitudinal wave. And most of the things that we already covered in chapter 15 will be uh, also applied to sound. But there are some things that are unique to sound. And we're going to be basically exploring in greater detail in this chapter. So. So like the highlights of this chapter, right? The, the, the units is, so we're gonna study about characteristics of sound, mathematical representation of longitudinal waves, and then some applications. So how to represent sound in terms of intensity and in terms of the intensity level, we call it like decibels. Then look at the standing waves, um, in terms of like, let's say sound standing waves, uh, we're gonna be using uh, open tubes or closed tubes and look at how the same standing wave that we looked at uh, generating on a string can also be applied to a, uh, a sound waves. Then we're look, gonna look at um, superposition uh, specifically for the sound, how you can have two sound sources and you can have a constructive and destructive interference and then, you know, we're going to look at beats. Also, we're going to look at, you know, interesting, uh, let's say, application of a sound wave, which is known as a Doppler effect. Not unique to sound waves, but probably, you know, sound wave, this Doppler effect is um, more visual, let's say, if you're talking about like sound waves. It can also be applied to light waves, but only if you're looking at the long distance stars and things like that. Anyways, um, in terms of then sound, remember, so sound is a longitudinal wave, means that the medium that generates the sound wave propagates back and forth, not perpendicular to the direction of the wave, but back and forth with respect to the direction of the wave. All right, so one important thing about sound is that it requires a medium, it's a mechanical wave, and the medium for sound is molecules. So, for example, if there is no air molecules, there is no sound. You can't hear me in the room if there are no air molecules. So that's why there is, for example, there is no such thing as sound in space. Because space is vacuum, there are no molecules there, there is no sound. So, you can also have sound in water. For example, actually sound is moving much faster in water than, um, let's say, in air. So that means, you know, it requires molecules that molecules basically vibrate back and forth and transmit the information. So generally, uh, you can think of like, let's say you need, you know, some kind of moving fluid, right? So moving, li you know, liquids or gas in order to propagate the sound. And it has different speeds. And here's a table for the, you know, the sound, um, speed of sound in different materials. So you can see that even in air, it you know not only depends on the material, it also depends on temperature. So this is you can think of like around room temperature, so 20 degrees Celsius. It is moving at 343 meters per second. At zero degrees Celsius, it's moving at 331 meter per second, and so on and so forth. That means generally the speed changes with temperature, and there's this equation where we can take speed to be approximately 331, which is, you know, at zero temperature, a zero degree, you know, Celsius temperature, and then plus 0.6 times T meters per second. So we can technically use this equation to then uh, referencing the speed of sound in, uh, let's say in air at zero degree Celsius, and to find the temperature uh, or the speed at different temperatures. So you can see, right, technically this term can become positive or negative depending if you're going above the zero degree Celsius or below the zero degree Celsius. So this is basically for the uh, speed of sound. You can use this in a way for, for other mediums too, but we're gonna pretty much concentrate on mostly looking at the speed of sound in air. So 343 e meter per second is at the room temperature. That's gonna be mostly used for most of the applications in this chapter, unless you're specifically told that there's a different temperature, 
go ahead and use 343. So for example, so here's uh, one application we're gonna see at the end, which is the you know uh, ultrasound. So there's an image of a baby and we use sound wave to actually generate that image. So we're gonna talk about that at the end. And another thing about sound here is, for example, humans have audible range. That means we can hear the sound between 20 hertz and up to 20,000 hertz. That's, this is known as audible you know, range for humans. There could be animals that can actually hear behind that, you know, in terms of like a way above 20,000 or way below 20 hertz. But for us, it's sort of like, let's say that. So uh, we're gonna talk about, let's say there's loudness, right? And the loudness is pretty much uh, in terms of the pitch of a sound. So, um, and frequency is related to the pitch of a sound. So you can see that low frequencies are perceived as low pitch, like a bass notes, right? Uh, and in the high frequencies are, you know, high pitch, like a treble notes. And sound waves, they're above 20,000 hertz is known ultrasound. So that's an ultrasound if it's greater than 20,000, so above 20,000. And then the sound that is less than 20 hertz is known infra sound. So let's say then the frequency, let's say if less than 20 hertz is an infrasonic. Okay, so, uh, and this is, for example, an image that generated with the ultrasonic, at ultrasonic frequencies, let's say 50,000, 100,000 hertz, and you can generate an image of a baby, for example, um, that is basically, you send a sound wave and it goes, it can go through the skin, but then, you know, certain things like, you know, it cannot go through, but most of the time, what we're gonna see, what we also learned in the last chapter is that wave reflects, right? It reflects back, you know, even if it transmits, it always reflects parts of it, you know, back. So that means parts of the information is always reflected back. And then we can use that to generate an image like that. All right, so one thing about this, you know, a sound wave, we can have two different representation of that. One is in terms of how the molecules are displaced when there's a vibration. So let's say there's a speaker and then the speaker vibrates the air molecules in front of it. That's how the sound wave propagates. So we can represent sort of like, let's say a graph of displacement of those molecules as a function of position. That means, you know, vertical position as a function of horizontal position. But we can also represent in terms of the a pressure in terms of like, let's say a region where there is a high concentration of air molecules is known as expansion. And then another region where it is known as a, oh, sorry, a region where there's actually a high concentration is known as a compression. And the region where there is a low concentration is known as expansion. So generally, obviously, compression is higher pressure because you have more, you know, air molecules and air molecules, basically, uh, more air molecules you have, more collision, more interaction, higher pressure. Lower the, you know, the concentration, well, lower pressure. So when you're doing the graph, you can do a graph of this, you know, a pressure as a function of position and the pressure changes. And you can see, right? So this is high, you know, let's say that the highest concentration. So you have a, uh, you have a, a crest and then low concentration, you have a, tr a trough, trough, you know, crest and a trough and so on and so forth. So that's kind of like in terms of doing the graph for the uh, pressure as a function of position. You can also look at in terms of displacement, as I mentioned, right? And one thing you will see that they are about 90 degree out of phase. So the crest, and a troughs, they are not top, on top of one another. That means you don't have a crest of uh, displacement versus position graph compared to the pressure versus position. They are exactly uh, pi over two or 90 degree out of phase, okay? All right, so here's then what we can do. If we are looking at to derive some kind of equation um, to represent uh, how the sound wave is propagating, 
Uh, so it's very similar to the traveling wave equation that we had in the, in the previous chapter. So we can see that generally, when we talk about, let's say, as, you know, air molecules moving, we can look at how the air molecule molecules moving uh, in some kind of like, let's say, a volume of interest. So here's, for example, we start with this. So this is some kind of, you can see, right, the some kind of fluid, you know, because again, it could be liquid or a gas. So um, let's say some kind of fluid that is being disturbed and then it's basically propagating. So what we have here is L sub I represents the length. And let's say, obviously we have sort of like, let's say the, you know, the area, let me use a different color. So let's say the area of interest. So you have area and length. And let's say this is the column of, you know, air concentrate, concentrated, like let's say fluid that we're considering. So let's say that's the crest, for example. And then it moves as a function of, you know, time and position. So one thing we have here, we have, you know, this equation where change in volume, basically change in volume over the volume equals negative of the pressure over the B, which is the bulk modulus. So this is the equation that we have used before, where the pressure equals negative of B times delta V over V. So that's the equation for the bulk modulus. So you can basically also write it as a ratio like that. Now the idea here is this. So in terms of as the you know as the air column is uh, the, the you know fluid column is moving, there is a displacement. Okay, so there's a displacement, sort of like let's say this amount of this delta x. Okay, so then I can write this in terms of negative b times where delta v is change in volume. Well, I can represent change in volume in terms of, remember the volume is, let's say in this case will be, if you talk about area A or area S, so it will be S times some kind of, you know, a displacement, so the delta, delta D. Okay. So, oh, let, me, let me do it actually, you know, delta X over here. So the delta X and then change in volume then will be S times delta D. So then it becomes delta D over delta X, but you know, both of them in terms of S times delta D and S times delta X. Okay, so we have basically something like this. So this is delta V and this is V. Well, from here, we can then cancel the delta, cancel the S, and we have the negative B delta D over delta X. And then we take the limit. So P is equals to the limit where delta X approaches zero. And this becomes B times partial derivative of D with respect to X. And that's basically what we have over here. So negative B times partial derivative of D with respect to X. Remember, D here is the distance those molecules go back and forth, right? So basically that they're, they're like, let's say local displacement because of the vibration. And then the Delta X is just general displacement of the, the wave itself, because those molecules just vibrate back and forth, back and forth. And Delta, you know, this D, right? This Delta D technically represents that particular local vibration. All right, so if, if I take then that equation um, and remember displacement wave. So this is a displacement wave that we have seen in previous chapter where D is a function of X comma T equals A amplitude sine of KX minus omega T plus V naught, which is a phase constant. Well, what we could do in here is this, this was the equation for the, for the traveling wave. And then P, a pressure wave is basically negative B times then the derivative of that as a function of X. And remember, this is a partial derivative. That means we treat T as a constant and only take the derivative with respect to X. That means if you're doing the derivative, you first, you know, take the derivative of the sine, so which becomes cosine, 
And then you take the derivative of the argument of the sine, which is kx minus omega t plus v naught. And the only term that has x is this guy over here. So then the derivative of the kx is just basically k. And that's what you have. So that's why a was already there, b was already there. And then the derivative basically gives us cosine kx minus omega t plus v naught. And then this factor of k. Okay, so that was the derivative of this guy. Then from here, we can take those three quantities together, wave number times bulk modulus times the amplitude, and we're gonna call that the pressure amplitude. So the pressure amplitude, K times B times A. Okay, so that's basically the pressure amplitude. So we can replace that, you know, a product of those three quantities as a just P max, maximum pressure, you know, as a you know amplitude of that p as a x comma t so basically it was a pressure wave okay so then again going back then then replacing um what the wave number is for example if you remember right the wave number is two pi over the wavelength well two pi over the wavelength where wavelength was also speed divided by the frequency, that means I can say that this is two pi over the speed divided by frequency or two pi frequency over the speed. And then this term replacing, you know, K over here. That one, that's, that's basically what the second equation does. So that means this two pi F over, over the V is nothing but the, you know, wave number. Okay, so we'll place that and then we have to, you can see, right, it's basically amplitude depends on the frequency and the speed of sound, you know, in a way, speed of sound basically is a, it's a, it's a temperature dependent, but more or less we assume that to be constant if it's, a, you know, a room temperature. All right, and also look at the graph that we have. And also you can see that there are exactly, you know, 90 degree apart, right? There's an out of sync, you know, 90 degree, they're out of sync in terms of when this guy here is a cosine, this is then a sine. So that's always gonna be, gonna be in terms of this. So that's why if I move 90 degree from there to here, I'm pretty much getting that graph over there. Okay. So applying Newton's second law along X to displacement dx comma t of a small cylindrical piece of fluid basically gives us a wave equation, okay? That means we can pretty much derive this equation over here, very similar to the way we derived the last equation um, in the previous chapter. Uh, so this is just in terms of that, you know, a bulk modulus and rho is basically the density. So um, again, comparing this to the general wave equation that was discussed, right, for the string that I derived in the previous chapter, we can, you know, then rearrange and find the speed of sound equation that in terms of, let's say, bulk modulus and density. Okay, so here's another equation, right? So this is uh, just like, let's say, speed of a string wave had a specific equation, f of t over mu. Then the speed of sound in a fluid also has a unique equation where it's a bulk modulus divided by the density. So the density of that fluid. Okay, so another thing we have is, as I mentioned, right? So the sound, when you talk about the loudness of the sound, we can represent it in technically two different ways. So we can talk about in terms of intensity of a wave, which we already have looked at also. So intensity, if you remember, is power per area. So basically power itself is energy per unit time, then per unit area. So that's what pretty much this intensity is. Intensity is the, you know, how much energy is basically transmitted by the wave as a function of time through some kind of, you know, surface area A. Okay. Units, watts per square meters, that's for the intensity. And one thing we can do here is then when we talk about then sound, we can talk about sort of like, let's say the intensity of a, of a sound in terms of the, some kind of reference, let's say intensity. 
and the reference intensity is the what we call threshold of hearing. So this lowest one over here. And that is one times 10 to the negative 12. So things like this, in a way that is the faintest sound we can hear, okay? So we take that as a reference. So you can see, right, there are two columns. One is in terms of intensity. The other one is sound level. So we're gonna get to that in a minute. But the idea here is this. In terms of what we have here is you have your reference and then after, that's basically the lowest. And then after that, everything is pretty much increases. So in terms of the, you, you can see, right? For example, if you're comparing threshold of hearing to a whisper and to, I don't know, like a traffic, you know, a track traffic, a siren, a loud rock concert, right? All of those you know, volumes start increasing because they have more energy per unit area. That means, for example, if, you, if, you, if you're using like, let's say the, um, the membrane in your ear as a that surface area, right? And how much sound entering your ear, um, then for example, the values here as increasing also represents how much energy which, you know, enters your ear and how, uh, let's say, how much that affects the membrane in your ear, right? Because, you know, uh, more are allowed the music, the sound is, you know, more violently, let's say the membrane is vibrating. So that's why if you go into higher and higher, let's say a loud concert in a rock concert or, a, you know, threshold of pain, right? That means, you know, and or a jet plane and thing like that. Those are such high intensity, such high energy. That means, you know, let's say the membrane in your ear start vibrating so violently that it can technically a rapture. So that's why threshold of pain, so it can be actually you know, painful for you. All right, so. But you can see those numbers are, you know, kind of like not very easy to work with, right? A lot of, you know, small numbers, 10 to the negative 11, 10 to the negative 10, you know, negative 7, 8, and so on and so forth. So then what we have here is we have another sort of like, let's say, way of representing, you know, uh, this intensity of sound. This is in terms of the sound level in decibels, okay? That means we can take the sound intensity in watts per square meter, and we can use it to convert it to basically a sound level, which we can see a little bit you know, easier to work with because technically the same threshold of hearing is not some one times 10 to the negative 12, it's zero. Okay, And then after that, everything is increasing. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit easier, cleaner way of representing the sound level. Okay, So there's a very straightforward way of looking at it. It's not directly proportional or something like that. It's actually logarithmic. So the sound level measured in decibels, that's the units for the sound level, is 10 log of ratio of whatever intensity you're considering over the reference intensity, I not. So I not, remember, is the threshold of hearing. So we're going to take that as a reference. So that's right, for example, right? If you, if you, if you want to look at the, let's say, intensity, um, for example, a whisper, right? Which is one times 10 to the negative nine. So then you can say that this is equals to 10 log one times 10 to the negative nine over one times 10 to the negative 12. So here we get then 10 log, well, 1 times 10 to the negative 9 over 1 times 10 to the negative 12. Well, that just basically give us uh, 10 to the 3 or 1,000. Log of 1,000 gives us 3. And then 10 times 3, we get 30 dB. And that's what we have here, 30 dB for the whisper. So 30 decibels. All right, so relatively straightforward you know, conversion. We can even go back and forth. If, if I give you, let's say, intensity, you should then, oh, well, if I give you dB, you should then kind of go back and solve for the intensity. All right, so one thing we also have here is, you can see, right, in, to in increasing the sound level of 3 dB, uh, which is doubling in intensity, is a very small change in loudness. So, I mean, that's a small enough that we're not even going to be able to tell the difference. 
In open areas, the intensity of sound diminishes with distance. I mean, we know that, right? So if somebody's speaking one meter from you, you can hear it perfectly fine. Person goes 10 meters, you know, still fine, but 100 meters, you can barely hear. Like 1,000 meters, you can't probably hear anything. But because of, you know, this intensity being proportional to one over R square, further it is, you know, more scattering you get and energy kind of get dissipated, you know, and uh, you can't really hear much. So obviously then that's we assuming that, you know, so like an open space where the sounds technically can propagate in, in every direction. So that means, you know, that energy that is generated pretty much, you know, radiates in every direction. You can try in, in closed space, however, this, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit diff more harder to kind of keep, keep track of because of the reflections. So that's why, for example, let's say, if you're in a room, you have a speaker, you can't really find a blind spot or like, you know, sort of like blind spot in a way that, you know, the sound can cancel each other. But if you're in an open space, you can actually put two speakers, which we're gonna see in a little bit, two speakers such that you can find at some point where they're, you know, the waves actually cancel each other. You get a destructive interference and you can find a position where you hear no sound. All right, so that's kind of what we have. So this is equation for the, uh, in terms of intensity, right? It's one over R square. Well, uh, simply because, you know, um, remember the intensity equation is power per, you know, area and area generally, you know, if it's uh, like, let's say uh, three-dimensional, let's say the sound is moving as a sphere, area of the sphere here is four pi R square. So that's why it's one over, you know, one over R square dependence. So here, what we have is um, intensity equation that we derived in previous chapter. Then what we're doing here is we basically including some of these new things that we just derived for the uh, amplitude of a, a pressure wave. Because here we have a, a, the amplitude, and then I just showed you that change in pressure, right? This amplitude of the max, you know, the pressure wave is equals to, remember like it's K times B times A, which then can also, you know, once you replace K with a two pi over wavelength, basically becomes uh, two pi F B A over V. So that's basically the, the a pressure wave amplitude. Um, and then from here, we can even write it in terms of, so two pi F a over V. And then remembering that, you know, B is related technically to the velocity because square root of B over rho is equals to speed. So if I square both sides, so I get then V square is equals to B over rho or B is equals to V square times rho. So then I can rewrite this in terms of two pi times F times A, oh, sorry, there's a B over there. And then for the B, I'm replacing B with square, you know, V square over R. So V square, sorry, V, v square times rho divided by V, this cancels out. And then I have two pi F, A and rho. That's what the, you know, amplitude of the pressure wave can also be represented. Then from here, I can say that amplitude is equals to you know, a maximum amplitude for the pressure wave divided by two pi rho VF. And then replace that amplitude with this quantity squared. Okay. That means in a way what we have here then, if I'm doing that, then some of like, for example, pi square is gonna cancel out. Um, then let's say that one of the density is gonna cancel out and then the frequency is gonna cancel out. And we just have, intensity equation in terms of the amplitude of the pressure wave square divided by two times V times the density of the fluid. Okay. So just manipulation of the equation until you get something a little bit more simpler, a little bit more, uh, let's say specific compared to the previous equation that we derived. Okay. So in any case, in this, it, it shows that 
the intensity is proportional to the square of the uh, pressure wave amplitude. And one important thing to see from this equation, frequency cancels out. That means it's not proportional to frequency at all. It's independent of the frequency. All right, so this is in terms of the ear sensitivity. Um, let's say when you're talking about sort of like a loudness. So, and you can see, right, it varies with frequency. And these curves translate intensity into sound level at different frequency. So generally we are more or less more sensitive uh, at this region, somewhere between 1,000 and about 5,000. And this represents in terms of sort of like a units called phones, which is sort of like a sound uh, loudness level. Uh, and it shows that uh, in a way, the, the frequency that we see over here, right? It, it's, it's pretty much non-linear, non you know, it's kind of like a logarithmic. So, and whenever you hear some kind of sound at a thousand Hertz, let's say some decibel level, right? Uh, for something else, it might be a completely different decibel for the same frequency. So, so for example, 40 or 60 or 20, if you looking at the 1000 Hertz, let's say frequency, then, you know, let's say 20 dB for example, at 1000 and, but if you're looking at, for example, 100 Hertz instead of 1000 Hertz, same thing actually to have the same loudness should be, for example, instead of 20 should be around like, you know, maybe about 45 or 50, 50 or probably 50 uh, dB. Or for example, here 40 at 100, uh, 1000 Hertz, the loudness that you hear for that sound at 1000 Hertz, if you, if you have 100 Hertz, then same effect will be, uh, in order for same effect to happen, right? So same loudness, it should increase up to about 60 something dB. So that's why it's, it's not a linear, it's kind of like a logarithmic scale, so like, like that. All right, so now we're ready to look at some examples here. So here's an example where we have a 100 watt light bulb produces a five, five watts of visible light. Remember, light is a wave, so uh, we're not really looking at light in greater detail because it's not a mechanical wave, but still, it's a wave. We can apply most of the same thing, you know, some equations and properties as we talked about. So let's say 100 watt light bulb produces five watts of visible light. The other 95 watt are actually dissipated as heat and infrared radiation. That means things like this. When you, when you purchase a 100 watt light bulb, 95% of that light bulb, right, basically is wasted. You know, it doesn't produce, you know, light. It produces, you know, heat and infrared radiation. And infrared radiation is something we can't even see. So what is the light intensity on a wall two meter away from the light bulb? Okay, so assuming that you know, light, just like sound, propagates in three dimensions. We can look at it in terms of this. So intensity is equals to power per square area. And power is basically the effective power that we have, which is five watts. So five watts over the area. Well, area is four pi r square. So then five watts over four pi, well, r is the distance of, you know, two meters square. So we can say that it's zero point zero, sorry, 0 0.095 watt per square meters. That's for the intensity, you know, of the light on the wall two meter away from the light bulb. All right, so part B, it says a uh, Krypton laser produces a cylindrical LED red laser beam two millimeter in diameter with a five watt of power. What is the light intensity on a wall two meter away from the laser? Okay, so let's see what we have over here. So this is part A and this is part B. So for part B, we are basically looking at same equation. Intensity equals 
power per area. But if this is, let's say, a light bulb, when it produces light, light kind of propagates in every direction. So like a, like a sphere, spherical. But when you have a laser, laser is much more concentrated. So technically it moves like a, you know, there is like some kind of circular, you know, uh, cross-sectional area. So this becomes five watts over area, but for the circle, so pi r square. That means this is five, five watts divided by pi, so two millimeters in terms of the diameter, right? So we can use this, you know, half of that to be a radius, so one millimeter. So 0 0.001 meters squared, that's, you know, the cross-sectional area. So then we're gonna get 1.6 times 10 to the six watt per square meters. And you can see, right, what a big difference. This is basically 95 milliwatt. This is about, you know, 1.6 megawatt per square meters. Again, because it's much more concentrated, you know, and moves with much higher intensity. So that's why that's, let's say, you know, the, the lasers are very dangerous. You know, you don't want to point the laser towards someone's eyes and something like that, because they are, you know, very high concentrated energy and can damage it. Okay, so here's another example. The sound intensity level five meter from a large power saw is 100 dB. At what distance will the sound be more tolerable 80 dB. So now let's look at 100 dB. 100 dB, I guess apparently it's very dangerous. So we can go back to a table that I gave you. We can see right 100 dB, so like a siren at 30 meters. So it is, you know, let's say not quite threshold of pain, but you know, kind of close. 80 is sort of like, let's say a busy street traffic. So something that is more or less manageable, loud, but still manageable. So that's why it's, it's asking, you know, more tolerable 80 dB. So what we want to do here is we want to find in terms of uh, given the sound intensity five meter from a large power. So it's 100 dB, right? And we, we can see that there's sort of like a difference between those two of about 20 dB. Okay. That means we can say that uh, taking 100 as beta one and 80 as beta two. So we can find the difference, beta one minus beta two. So 100 dB minus 80 dB. So we get 20 dB. That's a, you know, difference in, in, in decibel level. All right, so what we'll do then is next. All right, so next what we'll do is this. So, so beta one minus beta two equals, so beta one here is 10 log I one over I naught and minus 10 log I2 over I naught, okay. So remember, so this is basically 20 dB. And on the right side, so I can factor out 10 and I have log of I1 over I naught minus log of I2 over I naught. Where from here, because for example, log A minus log B. So if I have log A minus log B, this is equals to basically log A over B. So using this, I can get that as in terms of 10 log, you can see, right? So 10 log, then I, I1 over I naught is my A, I2 over I naught is my B. 
So it becomes I1 over I0 divided by I2 over I0. I0 cancels out. And then I have just I1 over I2. Okay. So 10 log I1 over I2. That means what I have is this. So 20 dB is equals to 10 log I1 over I2. Okay. Now next, divide both sides by 10. So then here I have 2 dB. So that means 2 dB is equals to log I1 over I2. Okay. Then from here, so basically rearrange where I end up with I1 over I2. So take basically you know, the, the power of 10, right? So then it's equals to 10 square. So basically this becomes the exponent for my power of 10. So then this ratio, you know, that means kind of like this, right? Base 10, so then I1 over I2 is equal to then 10 square, which is then equals to 100. Now that I have this, now that I have that, you know, what that ratio is, next I can do this. Even though I'm changing the power that this is all going to generate is going to be the same, regardless if it's 100 dB or 80 dB. Intensity changes. But remember, what we're doing here, we're moving, right, at some distance D in order to change the, you know, intensity level. But power one is same as power two. And remember, intensity is power per area. So then power is intensity times area. That means power one is intensity one times area one. Power two is intensity two times area two. Or the ratio of I1 over I2. Ugh. All right. Ratio of I1 over I2 is then equals to the ratio of A2 over A1. Okay. All right, now, what I have here is my area two is four pi r, r two square. My area one is four pi r one square. Four pi's cancel out. That means that, you know, area two over area one just ends up being r two square over r one square. And what I have is that that ratio of r two square over r one square is equal to the ratio of i one over i two but I already have I1 over R2 is just nothing but 100. It is just nothing but 100. That means from here, remember, I wanna find the distance two, that means R2. And then from here, I can just say, you know what? R2, R2 square is equals to 100 times R1 square. Taking the square of both sides. So my R2 then is equals to square root of 100 times R1. Well, R1 is squared, so inside the square root, so it can come out. So R1 times square root of 100. Well, square root of 100 is also just 10. Well, R1 then was five meters. So five meters times 10, we get 15 meters. That means you have to go from five meters to a 50 meters in order for your sound level to decrease by just 20 but it's, you know, definitely makes a much more tolerable, let's say, sound to your ears. All right, so here's one more example. Two loudspeakers on elevated platform are at opposite ends of a field. Each broadcast equally in all directions. The sound intensity level at the point halfway between the loudspeakers is 75 dB. What is the sound intensity level at the point one quarter of the way from one speaker to the other along the line joining them? All right, so let's see what we have here. So you have two sound sources um, and we're given that halfway 
between them is 75 dB, but we want to find basically a one quarter of the way from one of them, what will be then the you know um, intensity level. So we're basically dealing with, um, let's say, very similar to the previous example, right? Two sources that produce same power. That means, you know, like, like energy per unit time, right? Because there are two, you know, you can think of like identical sound, sound, uh, loudspeakers. So they produce, uh, you know, sound with the same power. So let's say here's the first one. Let's say here's the second one. And the distance between them, I don't know, let's call this D. So then halfway right here, right? So let's say taking this guy to be zero, this one to be, for example, D, this is basically D over two, okay? And then what we have here at that point, we have our intensity one, which is, um, or, you know, intensity one, but let, let's say in terms of beta one equals 75 dB. And then we have somewhere over here, right? Quarter wave. So let's call this point one. Let's call this point two. At that point two, then what I have here is that this distance is one fourth of a D and distance is three fourths of a D, right? And then let's say beta two here is unknown. We wanna find that, but you know, let's say I two and beta two. Right, so we have intensity two and then intensity level two. So those are the things basically we're gonna be looking for, okay? So our goal is to find that beta two, okay? So is it gonna be, you know, higher than beta one or lower than beta one? Well, we're gonna find out once we do the calculation. Again, the idea here is that we're assuming that those two speakers producing same power and then let's say, it's an open region, right? It's a, you know, let, let's say a field. So there should be no reflection. So we don't have to worry about those things. So we can then use the equation for the, you know, delta, delta beta that we kind of like looked at already. That means we can say that delta beta is beta two over beta one. Okay. And same way, right? So, um, so like, let's say is 10 log I2 over I0 minus 10 log I1 over I0. And to kind of, kind of cut it short, remember this basically becomes 10 log I2 over I1. So A over B, right? This is A, this is B, so I2 over I1. So this one, since, you know, two, two minus one. So then the ratio is two over one, I two over I one. All right. So now again, power one is equals to power two. Okay. Uh, which means that basically, uh, again, power is equals to intensity times area. That means intensity one times area one equals intensity two times area two. So we can kind of look at it in terms of that. All right, so let's write down what I one is. So I one is equals to um, P over four pi D over two square plus P over four pi D over two square, which is basically, you know, from each one, right? At that point one, basically both speakers send a wave. And this is the intensity of both of those waves reaching at that point. So then combine those two together, we get two P over pi D square. All right, so then looking at intensity two, let's use this, so intensity two. So then again, same way will be P over, so the, the first one here, right? 
travels this much. So four pi d over four square plus p over four pi over three fourths of d square. Okay, so again, combining those two together, we should get 40, you know, kind of rearranging, right? So 40, 40 P over nine pi D square. And then from here, I can see that my I one was two pi, uh, sorry, two times power over pi D square. So that means I can rearrange this one in terms of the I1. I can say it's basically 20 over nine times I1, right? Because I can say that this is 20 times two, and then that's basically my intensity one. All right, so that means writing intensity two in terms of intensity one. That's because remember, there's a ratio. We didn't have to, but it's easy. it will make it easier later on when we start canceling things. Okay, so if I come back to this equation again, delta beta is equals to then 10 log I2 over I1. Well, my I2 here is then 20 over nine I1 divided by well I1. So then I can, cancel the I1, that means just 10 log 20 over nine. Well, I calculate this, I'm gonna get 3.48 dB. That means change in beta going from point one to point two is 3.48 dB, okay. Well, this is equals to delta B, delta B was beta two minus beta one, and remember, I do have beta one, 75. That means beta two is equals to 3.48 plus beta one, which is 75 dB, right? Then what we get is 75 plus 3.48. So more or less roughly 70, so this, let's, let's say 78.48 dB. So that's then our answer. That means in a way it increases. So going from 75 to roughly 78.48 dB. Okay.